Hello, my name is Olivia Mattis and I'm president of the Sousa Mendez Foundation devoted to perpetuating the memory of the Holocaust hero and rescuer Aristides de Sousa Mendez. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today to our program called Destination Shanghai. We're going to see a movie together. We're going to meet three incredible speakers. And I'm delighted that you're all here with us today. So um, today's program is presented in partnership with the WNET group, PBS, Channel 13 in the New York area. And it's my honor to present uh, my co-host for today's program, Mr. Ed Hirsch, representing PBS. Ed, how are you today? Great, thank you, uh, Olivia. Thrilled to be here. And we at WNET are honored to partner with the Susan Mendez Foundation to showcase a fascinating and to many a little known story. For those of you outside of New York, WNET is New York's iconic Channel 13, one of the nation's foremost PBS stations. We have a long history of producing and presenting important historical and social justice documentaries in a city with a Jewish population second only to Tel Aviv. In fact, you might remember that in 1984, we first presented the landmark series Civilization and the Jews hosted by Ava Iban. Our efforts were given new impetus in 2015 when WNET received the largest bequest in its history from the estate of Dr. Simon Poida, a dentist, and his wife, Sylvia, a financial controller from Forest Hills, Queens. Before his death, Dr. Poida expressed his belief that WNET's history of quality programming made it the ideal, ideal vehicle to advocate for tolerance and to counter the forces of anti-Semitism. That bequest has now become the Sylvia and Simon B. Poida Programming Endowment to fight anti-Semitism, and I currently serve as its project director. In these dark times in our world, we will be using funds from the Poida Endowment to develop, produce, and present programs across the many platforms of PBS and WNET to remember the Holocaust and to shine a light on the roots and rise of anti-Semitism and extremism here and abroad. But like the Susan Mendez Foundation, we also share a desire to present uplifting stories of hope and courage. Tonight's film, Harbor from the Holocaust, is one such story the lives of nearly 20,000 Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi-occupied Europe were saved because one courageous diplomat, Dr. Feng Shan Ho, like Aristides de Souza Mendes himself, refused to stand idly by in the face of suffering. At great peril and personal risk, Dr. Ho provided visas to these desperate refugees so they could safely arrive in the Chinese port city of Shanghai. And it's so important that these stories be told and retold as an example to generations that follow and to provide the emphatic rebuttal to those who ask, but I'm just one person, what can I do? What you're about to see is an extended excerpt from this remarkable film produced and directed by the incredibly accomplished independent filmmaker, Violet Defong. The full length film will be shown nationwide on PBS this Tuesday, September 8th at 10 p.m. Eastern including on 13 here in New York. If you're outside the New York metropolitan area, check your local listings for the air date and time. And stay with us after this excerpt for some amazing and fascinating insights from our honored guests. Major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional support provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Philip Chosky Charitable and Educational Foundation, the Posner Foundation of Pittsburgh, and by viewers like you. Thank you. It was a strange atmosphere. When you're on a boat, that sort of feels like vacation. But on the other hand, you were really sailing into a black hole. 
you didn't know what in God's name awaits you there. I wondered, would any of us ever be all right again? other city in the world during the Holocaust getting to save. So many Jewish life like Shanghai did. Most of them live right in this neighborhood here. And my question to you will be, pourquoi Shanghai? You live in Germany, you live in Austria, you live in Poland. Why are you coming to here? I was in Vienna from one to about 11 years. I was a skier and I was an ice skater, and it was a perfect life. My dad owned a furniture store in Berlin. It was a large family. My father was one of nine. We kids played, and it was just like a regular childhood. There was absolutely nothing to warn of what was going to happen. In November 9, 1938, which is known as Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass, that's when everybody started saying, oh, this is getting bad. My aunt and uncle knew that the time had come. We get out now, or we don't get out. The problem was that while there was a lot of sympathy in the world, very few countries wanted to accept us. My father, who was a career diplomat, uh, was posted to Vienna, Austria, to the Chinese legation there in the spring of 1937. And as soon as Hitler came in, the persecution was so public, so humiliating, he just couldn't stand by. So he came up with a very ingenious strategy. Situated near the mouth of the Yangtze River, it is the biggest city in China. As the largest seaport in the Far East, it dominated the commerce and foreign trade of China. So what happened to Shanghai was that it was essentially divided up. Different imperialist powers would go in. It started with the British in 1840, after the Opium War. Then the Americans came in. They got a part. Later, the French arrived. And then, starting in the 1930s, you have the Japanese. From North China down the coast of Shanghai, roll the storm clouds of war. The Japanese began invading China in the early 1930s, and they start in the north in Manchuria and gradually come closer and closer. And in 1937, they gradually are closing in on Shanghai. They encircle it. When Japan routed the Chinese government, they left, and they left the port of Shanghai with nothing. You know, with no immigration, no passport control, nothing. So my father seized on that opportunity to issue visas to one place that didn't require visas, Shanghai. Somebody says, you know, there's a long line standing in front of the Chinese consulate. Why don't you go there? And my father went to that long line, and he stood in line, and within five minutes, he had a visa. And he came and said, say, we can always go to Shanghai. That's all he knew. In their wildest dreams, they never thought, I'm going to be living in Shanghai. I don't think that ever entered anybody's mind until it happened. When I read about the faraway land, I saw lovely pictures of dainty Chinese ladies in long silken gowns, strolling in beautiful gardens. Butterflies fluttered about the snowy white heads of huge chrysanthemums. And then, the anchor dropped, the engine stopped, the gangplank came down and connected us to our new world. And what a world it was.
Shanghai was chaos, dirty, unmanaged. From here to here, you weren't walking alone. There was always one line of people, another line, another line, probably with some goats and pigs slithering between you. We loaded our belongings on rickshaws. They pulled us to a flea bag hotel where we made the acquaintance with the scourge of Shanghai, bed bugs, mosquitoes, rats. But there were no guns. Nobody shot at us. The people who got off those ships, many of them had no money at all. They came with 10 marks in their pocket from Germany. And how much could that possibly provide? And here they are trying to find a place to live. My mother began to cry, and my father said, we'll get you out of here, we'll get you out of here. I closed my eyes against the light. I tried to shut out the busy noises around me. And right there, young and as green as I was, I made up my mind that I would have as little as possible to do with China. Shanghai would serve as a waiting place, a place to go from a place of home. The Jewish community of Shanghai was actually very diverse by this point. There were the Jewish refugees coming from uh, Vienna and from Berlin. There was also a Russian Jewish community, Russian Jews who had come after the Russian Revolution. But the first wave were the Baghdadi Jews who come in the 19th century. All of the Baghdadi Jews who came were global financiers already. They were dealing with India, they were dealing with London. And they end up taking over the opium trade. I think ultimately what the wealthy Jews realize is, is that their fate is tied to these refugees. They, they can't turn their back on them. Victor Sassoon, who is really the king of Shanghai, he's a billionaire, very influential. What happens over the next year and a half, two years, is this ballet that goes on, or you could call it a con job, where Victor Sassoon encourages the Japanese to believe that he's talking to the British government, he's talking to the Americans, he'll think of investing in Japan. Just keep on protecting these Jews who are coming in, and I'll make sure things work out. And so the Baghdadi Jews begin to find the refugees housing to feed them, helping them pay for things. There were one or two Jewish families, very wealthy, and one of them sent some kettle trucks to pick us up and bring us to some home in one of the Chinese areas. You walk down the alley and you see laundry hanging out everywhere, and you're living practically on top of each other. One of the things that was absolutely shocking is that they would have a toilet in their room. They would have buckets. Anybody who doesn't know what the honey bucket is, it's the toilet that gets picked up every day by a big wagon, and the wagon gets filled and got drawn through the lane, and it used to spill a little bit of the stuff on the road. The living conditions were way more primitive than in other parts of Shanghai. Hongqiu, where the refugees lived, had been occupied by the Japanese in 1937. <laughs> Sometimes you could see these little straw packages, and we all knew those were dead babies who had died over the night of starvation and things like that. I was stunned by that. And not only did I have a sense of empathy, for the difficulties of the Chinese, which, which were the same as ours, surviving in a very difficult environment. But I guess underneath that was also the fear that that could happen to me. I realized it was one world. The Chinese were very, very gracious to the immigrants. We lived amongst them. They were poor, and 
they accepted us. There was definitely compassion for each other. They had nothing to give us any more than we had to give them other than friendship and being together. How do you feel if you are marginalized, if what you want doesn't matter, if you don't have a government to protect you, if you think nobody even knows you exist? It's a feeling I've never forgotten. And that's how the refugees felt. I think for the parents, this was the most heartbreaking thing. They thought, my children have no future, my children have no hope. What I think really changed that for them was the Kaduri school. A very wealthy Jewish man by the name of Horace Kaduri opened a school for the Jewish kids. Life at the Kaduri school was, for me, one of the most important things of Shanghai. I have memories of doing what you would consider normal things under unnormal circumstances and you made lifelong friendships because you were all in the same boat. We had Jewish youth organizations and we had theatrical plays. It was always to a Jewish theme, all the time. We were taught you are Jews no matter what, and that sticks. A savage blow unparalleled in infamy. Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. Yet a day promised intolerable suffering and sacrifices to so many nations, and eventually presented Shanghai Jews with a whole new set of troubles and undiluted anguish. Some of the wealthy Jews were actually um, imprisoned and tortured by the Japanese because the Japanese believed that they had been conspiring with the British and the Americans against the Japanese. Victor Sassoon has fled. These wealthy Jews who had protected the refugees, who had supported them, now were powerless. The Japanese were now in charge. And they're formally allies with the Germans. Suddenly, without any warning, there appears in the newspapers a proclamation which says that in 90 days, you have to give up where you live and move to the worst part of town, half destroyed during the war. Maybe half the Jews were living in other parts of Shanghai, and they were all ordered to abandon their apartments, abandon their belongings, and trudge over to this ghetto, which was monitored by Japanese guards, which was adding another 10,000 people to a community that was already filled, overflowing. You're essentially doubling the population of Jews. The room was like maybe 15 feet by five feet long for the three of us. It had one window. But we lived there, my father, my mother, and I, for six or seven years. It's... Where we wound up, it was a room with 14 people sleeping there. We put like blankets on the sides of our bed, undressed and dressed in bed, because there was no other space. We had a small table in front of the bed, and that's where we took our meals. There was so much poverty, people getting sick, people dying of, of all these rare diseases. You see someone that you, you would see on a regular basis and the next day they were gone, they died because they got ill, they didn't have enough food, they had dysentery, it was, it was just dreadful. And a lot of Europeans died as well, especially the elderly. Hong Kyu was bordering on despair and hysteria was putting it mildly. It took me a long time to go to sleep that night. There was so much to worry about. The American Joint Distribution Committee was the main organization trying to deal with a worldwide refugee crisis as Jews were fleeing Europe. 
There are tens of thousands of refugees in Shanghai. The crisis has become so big, the joint finally decides that it has to do something. And they go to a woman named Laura Margolis. They bought these huge, like, warehouses, what we called Jaime. And Laura Margolis was able to get $100,000, and with that money, we spent to get a hospital, 200-bed hospital. I was a secretary. I was extremely happy to be working in a hospital because I saw people were being helped. Even though it was war years, life started picking up and people tried to recreate a little Europe. They begin to build their own independent communities with German newspapers and German cafes and orchestras. It's very important to have some culture so that you don't feel, even though you physically you're alive, but your mind has gone dead and you've lost everything that you've always had. Community action can make an enormous amount of difference. And that's what happened when we were finally locked up by the Japanese in a kind of a ghetto. The energy of adversity ended up in some kind of creativity even, and that helped the people to survive. The whole experience taught me that nothing is for sure. Everywhere I live, I know that any day it might not be home anymore. And it's not that devastating if it does happen. I've never carried a chip on my shoulder. Why me? If I ask why me, it's why me did I get saved and didn't get killed and was able to live in Shanghai and grow up. That's the why, you know, that's the why me. We live in an age now where there are people that need to escape their countries because of the horrors that are going on. It breaks my heart to see people trying to come to our country that is plentiful being turned away. This never happened to us when we went to Shanghai. Shanghai opened their arms to us. Hey, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Welcome. Have a seat. Sit down. Nobody can really imagine what it was like for me to f meet you and find out who your father was. My father was never reunited with any of the people that he helped. He was unknown to most of them. And so when I meet these people, I feel that my father's efforts were worth it. It's like a miracle to me. And you and I have become very good friends. Uh, it doesn't change the darkness, but it gives light into the darkness. This miracle occurred because certain people stepped up at the right moment. I think the Baghdadi Jews did. I think Laura Margolis did. Hafang Shan. So I think there were individuals who did it. But more than that, this was a place, the most unexpected of places, that saved these Jews when they needed help the most. Beyond politics, beyond, you know, rivalries and economics and military things, in the end, there was a human connection that was established between the Chinese and the Jews. And I think that created a common bond that you certainly didn't see anywhere else in the world.
it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel. Again, my name is Olivia Mattis. I represent the Sousa Mendez Foundation. And serving with me on the foundation is Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, who is a historian and who for 25 years worked at Yad Vashem as the director of the Department of Righteous Among the Nations. We also have Man Manly Ho, who is the daughter of Dr. Feng Shan Ho. And uh, Manly Ho is a journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and she is going to tell you about her efforts to piece together this story. And we have psychologist, writer, and Shanghai survivor, Lotte Lustig Marcus, whom you saw in the film and who, whom you'll meet in person in just a little while. Right now, I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Mordecai Paldiel. But before he starts his remarks, let me just say, there will unfortunately not be ch a chance for audience questions to be answered by our panel today. I do encourage you to use the chat box and we will of course be uh, forwarding all of your comments and questions to our panelists um, who may choose to respond individually at a later date, but there's no uh, time for that today. But I do encourage you to keep all of your questions also for next week when we will have a very interactive program. So, um, with that, let me turn the floor over to my dear friend, Dr. Mordecai Paldiel. Mordecai, how are you today? Thank you, thank you, Olivia. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the context uh, of Vienna. What led Jews to, to leave that, that friendly city of uh, Vienna, the city of the waltzes of Johann Strauss, and uh, the city of a great culture, a lot of culture, the city of Sigmund Freud, and uh, wander go all the way to China. Well, we have to remember Hitler came to power in 1933. Persecution of Jews in Germany began immediately. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 uh, disenfranchised the German Jews. Jews were leaving, but Austria was still safe. And then in March 1938, uh, Hitler took over Austria, and Austria became part of Germany. And the persecution of Jews began in Austria more viciously than they... Uh, had occurred in Germany, and that is in March 1938. In fact, uh, the uh, Ho was watching uh, together with, uh, in the testimony of uh, Lilith uh, Sylvia Doron, who knew uh, Ho from before, they were watching as the Germans were marching in into uh, Vienna, and immediately starting abusing the Jews, forcing them to clean the streets, and so forth and so forth. Uh, this led to pressure on the, the United States. Uh, President Roosevelt then called a conference in Avion in July 1938. 32 nations were invited to gather in Avion, which is a resort city in France, uh, to discuss what could be done about the Jewish refugees who were trying to get out both from uh, Germany and from occupied Austria. And they all expressed a great sympathy, but they all said, sorry, there's no room for them in their own country. They have to stick to very strict uh, immigration laws. And that, that was, uh, to the Germans, this seemed very hypocritical because as Hitler said in his speech, I mean, they criticize uh, Germany for the mistreatment of the Jews. They say the Jews are people of genius who contributed so much civilization, and yet they don't want to admit more Jews. In other words, they're hypocrites. Uh, so uh, this led later on in November 1938 to what is the big program, Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht was a Nazi stage program, pogrom against the Jews in uh, Germany and Austria, the burning of the cinema. But the, the main purpose behind this was to force the Jews to leave whatever come. Until then, uh, Jews were leaving, but not in the number that the Nazis wanted Jews to get out. This was a time when the Nazis still allowed Jews to leave. And so uh, this program led uh, to the creation of what is called the Kindertransport, uh, where up close to 10,000 children were separated from their parents and uh, were taken to England and where they stayed uh, over the war. Uh, many of the parents uh, did not survive in Germany and in Austria. They were sent to concentration camps. Uh, and when I worked at Yad Vashem, 
and uh, I was responsible for the Department of the Righteous among the nations. And uh, when I first became aware of the story of Feng Shan Ho, uh, there were some people who said, uh, what's the big deal about him? You could go to Shanghai for free. You didn't need a visa to go to Shanghai. And uh, the response, what people didn't realize, but you needed a piece of paper, a visa, in order to get out from Germany. Uh, the, the Gestapo and the SS, they didn't know whether you needed a visa or not to go any place. What they wanted to see in order to release you, because during uh, Kristallnacht, over 20,000 Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. Some died. You could be released if you showed that you had some kind of a visa going to a country. Well, you couldn't get a visa to the United States. You couldn't get a visa to this country and that country. This is when Ho stepped in and he gave the people who lined up in front of the uh, Chinese consul general and he gave them these visas to go to China. And so the people took uh, their passports, showed it to the Gestapo. The Gestapo released their husbands, their fathers, gave them 48 hours, two days, three days, four days to get out. And uh, so people uh, then uh, left in time, 1938 until uh, 1939. I want to mention something else uh, uh, about uh, Feng Shang Ho. He began to issue visas even before Kristallnacht. He didn't wait for Kristallnacht to happen because he was seeing what was happening to the Jews in Austria even before Kristallnacht. It was no paradise. The estimates are that between 4,500 to 5,000 Viennese Jews wound up in uh, Shanghai. Now, we all know why Shanghai, because Shanghai was an open, a part of Shanghai was an open city. It was managed by a consortium of, of uh, governments and uh, it was free to, to go there. Uh, and so uh, what the paradox is suddenly, there, there's a German settlement in Shanghai, a lot of German Jews, not only German Jews, there were others, but the German Jews were, were one of the largest, perhaps the largest uh, community uh, in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, the, the other thing I want to mention uh, is about the way they were received by the Chinese people. Why do I mention that? Because anywhere else in Europe, when Jews were fleeing for their lives, uh, in many places, they were not received with, in, uh, in a friendly way by the local population. In fact, some of them were very hostile, and some, some of them even uh, hurt them. Uh, some of them turned them over to the, uh, to the Nazis, uh, because, you know, they were also suffering. Well, the same thing was in China. The Chinese people were undergoing a severe suffering. Uh, they had been at war with Japan, even before World War II broke out. Uh, way back in 1931, the Japanese took over Manchuria. And then in 1937, the war was declared between Japan and China, 1937. That's two and a half years before World War II. And the Japanese began to occupy one city, <coughs> one region after the other. And finally they came to Shanghai and they treated horribly the Chinese uh, population. Uh, and uh, so you would expect that the Chinese, they were seeing these German Jews coming in and taking up these, these places where, which they wanted, and uh, they, they wouldn't uh, like that. On the contrary, what most of the people who were in Shanghai, uh, most of the Jewish people, they, they tell only of a very friendly attitude of uh, the Chinese uh, population. The many accounts, many narratives, so this is something about the Chinese people uh, that uh, speaks in their favor, that they have uh, what I call compassion uh, for others. Although they are suffering, but they have compassion for others uh, uh, that also suffer. Uh, finally, I want to go back to my work at Yad Vashem. At Yad Vashem, we honor persons who risk their lives to save Jews. Uh, Usually, uh, it is sufficient uh, for a person to have sheltered one Jewish person at the time of when the Nazis were there, uh, for that person uh, to be the recipient of the honor of righteous among the nations. When it comes to diplomats, we usually, at Yad Vashem, uh, the uh, criteria established for diplomats 
is that they save not just one or a handful, but they save many uh, in the hundreds, uh, and some of them in the thousands, like uh, Susan Mendes and like uh, Feng Shan Ho. Uh, and that they did it by disobeying or not following uh, the policy of their own government. So here I want to say just a few words about what was the, what was the situation between China and Japan. China, uh, I'm sorry, between China and Nazi Germany. China and Nazi Germany were on a friendly relationship uh, up until late 1939 into 1940, when finally uh, Japan uh, sided up with Nazi Germany. There were officers of the uh, Chinese army, the Nationalist Army, including the son of Chiang Kai-shek, who were training in Germany. Uh, the Chinese ambassador in Berlin was interest, interested in keeping a friendly relationship with uh, Nazi Germany to counter the Japanese aggression. And so here's Ho, who is handing out visas to thousands of Jews at the displeasure of the Nazi authorities. So uh, Ho was urged, was told to stop. Uh, we're talking not individual, one or two or three persons, that could be forgiven, but the hundreds and thousands. So he is disobeying his own government uh, by issuing these visas. So at Yad Vashem, these are the two conditions, the uh, issuing of visas to numerous Jews in the hundreds and thousands, and the person who does that disobeys or doesn't follow the policy of his own government. So when I received all the documents of Feng Shang Ho, I brought it before uh, the commission. There was a commission which is headed by a judge. It's like a jury. And I explained the situation and I explained the material. And the year 2000, uh, Feng Shang Ho, the first Chinese person, was added to the list of the righteous among the nations. A few years later, uh, his daughter, uh, Manly, and her brother, Manto, came to Yad Vashem. We had a very beautiful ceremony where we handed them uh, the uh, medal and the uh, certificate uh, of honor. And their name now appears proudly in the Garden of the Righteous uh, at Yad Vashem. So this is uh, what I wanted to say so far. The context that everywhere else in Europe, all these nice people, all these people who believed in democracy, the United States, England, Canada, uh, Australia and so forth, they had no room for Jews. And here comes Ho, and he says, in China, which was the most populated country uh, in the world at that time, and, and it still is today, there is room for Jews, there is room for people who need to be saved, and uh, I'm going to play my part, my humanitarian part, and issue visas so they can get out from where they are, into a safe haven. So that is the beautiful story of Feng Shan Ho uh, against the backdrop of what is happening in Europe. Manly, let's turn to you now. Oh, Dr. Paldiao Mordechai, whom I met six months after my father passed away, and I had started to do research um, on my father's efforts. I mean, it was a cold case, long buried, nobody knew anything. And I remember asking Dr. Paldiel when I met him at Yad Vashem, have you ever heard of Shanghai visas? And he said, yes, we have, but we don't know who issued them. And so from there, um, I embarked on this essentially 20 year odyssey to try to document and cover uh, my father's story uh, and what he did in Vienna. So um, if we could have the first slide, um, that is a photo of my father uh, at the time that he became Consul General of China and Vienna. And it was right, it was a month after the Anschluss, which was the union of Austria and Germany. And it was that union, as Dr. Paldiel mentioned, that essentially precipitated this refugee crisis, which other countries during the Evian conference turned their backs on. My father, though, was in a very difficult position as the representative 
of a country that had been occupied by the Japanese. So essentially, there were no ports of entry available to him. And especially, his only instrument, which is the instrument of all diplomats, an entry visa, was essentially useless because the Japanese would never recognize uh, a visa by a Chinese diplomat. Then there was the added problem, of course, uh, which Dr. Paldio mentioned, of um, his home government having uh, relations with Germany, long-standing relations. They were actually arms sales, um, and uh, they were, by 1938, uh, very upset because Hitler, having seen Japan conquer China, was contemptuous of the Chinese and was turning to the Japanese. So they were desperately trying to salvage um, their relationship with Germany and therefore didn't want anything to get in the way. So those were the two obstacles that my father had. Where, where in China could he um, access and the, the displeasure of his own government? So he had to come up with essentially an ingenious solution. And that was what we would call in, in medicine an off-label use for a Chinese uh, entry visa. And so he picked the only place in China that was accessible at that time. And that was the port city of Shanghai, which is, it was a semi-colonialized city. And after the Japanese invaded and took over in 1937, the other colonial powers did not want Japan to take over the port. So the port was completely unattended. And that meant that anybody could arrive, no visa, no passport, no documents. You just landed and you got off. So he chose that as a destination for his visas. Now, his visas were, as Dr. Paul Diel had mentioned, not really useful for entry. However, they were useful for proving to the Nazis that you had what they were called an proof of emigration. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the various uses of his visas. And the first one um, that we're looking at is um, Hetty Lester and her mother, Margaret, and their visa um, to Shanghai, which they used actually to go to the Philippines. So my father himself had said, these visas are to Shanghai in name only. It's to facilitate people to use them and essentially hopscotch their way to their preferred destination. So the next visa that we're going to see is, um, a, um, oh, by the way, I wanted to shout out uh, to Hetty and her family who are in on this uh, meeting. And the next one is the first visa that I saw. And that was issued to Oscar Fiedler, who just by chance was born on the same day as my father. And this visa was, was sent to me by his son, Harry, who was born in Shanghai. So we're going to look at the next slide. Yes. And I want to say hello to Harry, who's all, also in on this meeting. So Oscar uh, Fiedler, they actually went to Shanghai. Oscar's visa was one of 20 that was obtained by his nephew, uh, Eric Goldstab. And, I, and Eric uh, was able to um, take a picture of their trip to Shanghai. Can we see the next slide, please? Yes, there they are on, in December 1938 on the, the Conte Biancamano. At that time, the Italian line called Lloyd Tristino was basically doing a little war profiteering. And they were ferrying um, Jewish refugees to Shanghai. A lot of times they, they asked that they buy first class tickets, you know, a little. And so between 38, in the 38, and into right before the, the outbreak of World War II, which uh, in August, 19, uh, in September, they, they, they ferried thousands of Jews 
um, to, uh, to Shanghai. And so um, then uh, the other use uh, of my father's visa, and could I have the next slide too also, is it got people out of the camps, especially after Kristallnacht. And this is my good friend, Arthur Kurtiman, and I want to say hello to his daughter, Debbie. Um, he was arrested and deported to Dachau uh, in 1938, and this is his mugshot um, from Dachau. Now, he, had, he was very clever, and he asked around whenever there were new prisoners coming in um, about what was going on, and by then, the idea of Shanghai, the mere mention of Shanghai, had spread around, and everybody said, if you got if you say you're going to Shanghai, you'll be let out. Now, Arthur wrote his, his monthly letter to his family saying, get me a Shanghai visa, get me a Shanghai visa. So his sister, uh, who, was, who had fled to England, got not a visa, but an affidavit from the Chinese embassy in London saying, we'll issue him a Shanghai visa as soon as he shows up with a passport. So on that alone, Arthur was led out of Dachau and he made his way to England where he got the visa, but that was useless because what happened is with a lot of these people when they're hopscotching is then he went to England, he went to the US uh, embassy and got to the US on the, uh, on the British quota because the Brits didn't have a big quota. Um, so um, another use of my father's visa. Could I have the next um, slide, please? Um, these are teenage visa recipients who were, who, were, who were on the Aliyah Bet, which was the illegal Palestine transport, because at the time, uh, the Brits under Arab pressure were not issuing a lot of certificates to go to Palestine. So there was this whole movement in, at the end of 38 through 39 of these illegal transports where most of the passengers were teenagers because their families wanted to save the next generation. So on the left-hand corner, bottom corner, is Lily, 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 Lily Lilienthal, uh, Doran is her married name, and her son Bazi, I'm saying hello, is in from Israel. Um, and Lily and her older sister, Ricky, got a Shanghai visa. They boarded this ship, the Sakaria, in Romania, uh, where it took them six months to get to Palestine. And once these illegal ships get to Palestine, they throw all their papers aboard, because, uh, off board, because what happens is they're using the Shanghai visas as a means to pass through the other ports that they have to pass through to fool people into thinking they're going to Shanghai when in reality, they're actually um, trying to sneak into Palestine. Now, there is another survivor, um, it's, and that's the father of David McGinn, who's also um, in on this meeting, Otto Fleischner, who, who got a Shanghai visa and used that as a pretext to actually go to Palestine and then went from Palestine to England. So, you know, these were the different uses of, of, of this visa. But I think the most important thing that happened with these visas to Shanghai was that it spread the word to Germany and Czechoslovakia, places where, where Jews did not have access to my father's Vienna consulate. It spread the word that there was this place in China where they could go, no papers, no needed, no questions asked. And so as a result, you know, 18,000 uh, Jews ended up in Shanghai uh, because, you know, it, the word got to them uh, that there was this place. Um, so the next, um, uh, can I have the next slide, please? So my father was never reunited with any of the people that he had helped. They never even knew his name. So, but I have had in my 20 years of chasing down um, this history, the good fortune to find and to meet some of the survivors. 
and one of my greatest honors was to meet Lottie Lustig Marcus. 17 years ago, Lottie and I found each other. And this is her passport, very unusual because usually children didn't get passports, but her father was so assiduous, he got her a passport. And she's 11 years old there. And like all passports issued by the Nazis, they had a red J stamped on the upper, on the upper uh, left corner. And the J was stamped because when after the Anschluss, when people started trying to flee, they would try to cross the border into Switzerland. And the Swiss were not happy. And so they told the Germans, you somehow need to have something to indicate who's Jewish so we can turn them back. And of course, Switzerland was supposedly a neutral country. So that's what they came up with, this red J. So now I will turn this over to Lottie so she can tell you herself, um, her story. Lottie? Oh. <laughs> All right, here I am. <clears throat> I must tell you that from 1938 to 2004, I had no idea that Dr. Ho was conscious of what he was doing because when we went and got our visa, <clears throat> my father said, my father who had been rejected by every consulate in Vienna, but then one day somebody said, look, they're giving out visas to Shanghai. He stood in line, he got it, and he came home and he said, well, if we can't find any other place, we'll go there. I had no idea until I met Man Lee, that it was her father who did know what he was doing and did it on his own. And we are the beneficiaries, my whole family. So this is really very important. But I imagine, I really want to stress that from 1938 till 2004, which is a lot of years, I had no idea. So this has been extremely moving to me meet you and to know the story. It's really very beautiful. And I must say that in these times when my father's brother was killed, my father's other brother would eventually be gassed. In this horrible Holocaust story, there's this light that your father stands for and Laura Margolis stands for. And then there was a Captain Katz who after the war came to Shanghai and said he heard that there were a lot of Jews there and can he help? And we said, well, we need jobs for these people and he found them jobs. So there's some light in the dark. I want to stress that. And it's just been a pleasure to have you as a friend. That's beautiful, Lottie. So Manly, um, perhaps let's go back to, um, you have some more slides to show us? Yeah. So let's, let's do that uh, at this point. This is back and I would like, you know, Mordecai to jump in here, if he will. Um, so this was the ceremony, uh, the righteous ceremony at Yad Vashem. And uh, we're standing in, in the garden of the righteous where the names of the righteous are carved by country uh, on the wall. And this was the unveiling, so to speak, of my father's name. And um, you see on there, on the left-hand side uh, is uh, my older brother, my late brother, uh, Manto. Uh, next to him is uh, Frida Rogel, who was a survivor, Shanghai survivor, who got my father's visa. Um, and then, um, Mordecai, I'm going to have to ask you to help me. Who is the gentleman next to me? I know he was a Yad Vashem official. Yeah, his name is uh, Yishai. And the thing that I, uh, he's uh, an Israeli born, a Sabra. And I have to tell you, Manly, that, that uh, when uh, I asked him that you have to come to the ceremony because we need a high official from Yad Vashem. And uh, he said, I got a problem. I don't wear a necktie. So I gave him my necktie, uh, which he is wearing there. 
because he was not accustomed like many Israelis are wearing a necktie. So he, that's uh, Yishai Amrami. Yishai, first name, Amrami, second name. He was uh, the vice chairman or the vice director of Yad Vashem at the time. So I am there too, my necktie. Your necktie. <laughs> Well, I don't know why we never got a picture together. I, I was there at the ceremony. So, seriously speaking, Manly, I was there, but not though, but I have some other photos where I am. Yes. No, I mean, but you I was were the, there. You were the MC at okay. the ceremony. I remember that. But anyway, um, so in the far right was the then uh, Chinese ambassador uh, from the People's Republic uh, to Israel, Penn Zandi. So it was a very moving and special ceremony. And I know that Mordecai, it took a lot for, for Mordecai to uh, investigate this case um, and to um, sort of navigate uh, the politics and the shoals uh, that, were, uh, that were there. And also um, to uncover and to find sort of more evidence because as I said before, this was, you know, 60 years later and it was a cold case. So can we have the next slide, please? So after the um, ceremony and my, uh, the publicity of my father uh, being designated a righteous, which everybody was very uh, uh, astounded by, um, my father's wish to be buried in his hometown of uh, Yang in Hunan province, was finally fulfilled. And so in 2007, uh, we I took my parents back and we inaugurated this grave. And I remember at the ceremony uh, for the unveiling, uh, I of course invited Mordecai uh, to, to participate as well as the then Israeli ambassador, Amos Nadai. Um, and the then, the present, some of the community members of the present Jewish community uh, from Shanghai also came. So that was very, um, in my mind, very, a very significant time. Um, can, can we have the next one? And then following that, it took a few years, as you can see, it's 20, it was 2015. Um, I finally, with the help of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, uh, managed to, oh, and my father's hometown, uh, got a plaque up, a commemorative plaque up um, on what was the former Chinese consulate in Vienna, where my father began his issue uh, visa <coughs> activities. And so, um, and that also, took some doing, uh, but, uh, you know, that was a very significant, uh, at least to me. You want a sculpture of your father there, right? The sculpture of you in front of the building. No, there isn't. Mark. There's a head sculpture of your father. Oh, no, no, that's in the Shanghai Refugees Museum. And unfortunately, it doesn't look anything like him. They didn't consult with me when they put that up. No, this is in Vienna. This is so the, the former consulate building is now the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, in case anybody wants to see it. So, you know. Um, so then what happened was, and can we have the next slide? So then in 2018, the uh, Chinese community and the uh, community of Milan decided that they wanted to name a little piazzetta after my father. And so there is, there we are unveiling Hofengshan Square, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been, it's been really uh, quite a journey. It's been a long odyssey and, uh, you know, Mordecai and I can tell you a lot of stories <laughs> about this, uh, but on the whole, um, you know, uh, I, I just want to say, can we have the next picture, please? Um, there is my father at age 90. And I just want to, you know, say that um, he, uh, there was only, he, he left very few clues, enough for me to do this research, but he said very, not very much about um, what he did, but he did say this, and this is the reason that he felt he had to save Jews. 
and this is a quote, on seeing the tragic fate of the Jews. It's natural to feel deep compassion and from a humanitarian standpoint to be impelled to help them. So I want to add something to what Ben Lee just said about uh, Feng Shan Ho. Usually when a diplomat gives a visa to a country, the intention is for that person to travel to that. But Feng Shan Ho gave visas to people whom he knew did not, had no intention to go to China. They just wanted to get out from Germany and Austria. And, and some of them wanted to go to Switzerland, to the Philippines, and to South America. But they needed to show to the Gestapo that they had an exit uh, visa. And they came to, to uh, uh, Feng Shang Ho and he said, oh, I'm giving you a Chinese visa, although I know you're not, you have no intention of going to uh, China. So that's very, very unusual for a diplomat to give a visa to someone, to, one, to the diplomat's country, when he knows that this person has no intention to go to that country, but is going to use that visa to go someplace else. All he wants to do is to get out from where he is. So that, that, that is a, this is something that one can only attribute to this diplomat, Feng Shan Ho. So I just want to add something else to what Manny said. How do you explain Feng Shan Ho? There's one word, compassion. If you have compassion, you find a way. All the diplomats that we honored, they, they were human beings. And they saw those people that they were trying to help as fellow human beings, and they had compassion, what in Hebrew we call rachamim, we say God is compassionate. And if you have compassion, you'll find a way. And I think that explains uh, Feng Shang Ho. I know very little about his background, his education, and so forth about his religious beliefs, but he had compassion for these people who were suffering that he saw with his own eyes, because he was in Vienna when the Nazis marched yeah. in. Uh, go ahead, Manny, you wanted to say something. Oh, I just wanted to quickly add that, you know, um, besides what he said about the humanitarian impulse, my father was a devotee of the most famous ancient tactician in ancient China, Zhuge Liang, which, who was a, a, a military as well as a political tactician. And so he merely used sort of, uh, strat, you know, his strategic uh, tactics to to make this happen because as I said he he really didn't have uh, you know any way of uh, issuing entry visas because there was no place to you know because of the Japanese and so Shanghai didn't need a visa and so he he even said to the visa uh, applicants you know these are these visas are to Shanghai in name only. In reality, you can use them as a pretext to go elsewhere to your preferred destination. So, so I'm going to take the floor back now. We're going to uh, ha uh, go back to our speakers in a moment for some final thoughts. But before we do, I would like to tell you briefly about our upcoming event. Next Sunday, we're having a very fun program and it's called What Makes a Hero? We're gonna see a lighthearted yet uh, earnest effort uh, by a, an Israeli filmmaker uh, in a film produced, uh, executive produced by Michael Moore. Uh, we're going to see that film. It's called 10% What Makes a Hero. And then we're going to join, again, Dr. Mordecai Paldiel, who'll be in dialogue with Dr. Eva Fogelman, who is a psychologist and an expert on the altruistic personality. Uh, so it'll be the two of them with the filmmaker next Sunday, and you won't want to miss it. That will be our last program before the Jewish holidays. Now, most of our programs are free or very nearly free. Next week's program is an exception. It's a ticketed program, uh, but the price of the tickets is whatever you would like it to be. We do have a suggested price of $18 representing life or high, but if you would like to give more, you'd like to give less, that is entirely your choice and it's tax deductible. So, and like uh, PBS, we do rely on the generosity of viewers like you. So we hope you will tune in for that next Sunday. Um, we do have a little clip of that film just to entice you. And so Matthew, if you could please roll that clip. Oh. 
When you were growing up, did anybody tell you that your father is a hero? No, 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 no. I don't call myself a hero. I call myself a person who did the right thing that you had to do. If you're looking for the origins of heroism, you need to understand where human empathy comes from. If you go inside this enclosure, I can almost guarantee that you will be killed. Sex, sex, sex. If you do good for others, it actually does good for yourself. That's the bottom line here. To give you a thousand dollars right now would not make me feel bad, I can guarantee you. That's right. But he might be dead in there. When you're trying to understand how you would behave, you have to say, what did the majority do? That's your best bet. Did you go to the army? Nice to meet you, Muhammad. Yeah. Hello? So I do hope you will all sign up for that film next week. So now let's turn back to our speakers for some final thoughts. Mordechai, go ahead. Feng Shang Ho was issuing visas in May 1939, he was still issuing visas. While in May 1939, uh, there was a scandalous thing happening on the high seas when a boat by the name of St. Louis was on its way to Cuba with over 900 German Jews who had visas to enter the United States, but they had to wait two years before their numbers came up. And uh, when they came to Cuba, the Cuban government changed its mind and then the boat headed towards uh, Fort Lauderdale and uh, the United States uh, did not allow these people to disembark, although they had visas, but they had to wait their turn for two years and the boat was returned to Europe and many of these people later on died in the Holocaust. The nine, over 900, 937 Jews, there was no room for them in the United States, although the United States had granted them visas already, but they had to wait at least two years. And here, there in Vienna is Shang Fang uh, Ho, who is issuing visas for people to leave immediately to go and get out and be saved. So that is the, uh, the significance of that person. Uh, but while everybody was reading the newspapers, what was happening to the St. Louis people, uh, he was issuing visas and he was saving lives. Uh, one other observation. All these people who got visas to China, all of them, perhaps with a few exceptions, all of them lost relatives in the Holocaust because not everyone in their families could get out, especially the older people, the very old people. They didn't want to take travel. They stayed behind and they were lost. So those people who got out were the lucky ones. All of this thanks to Feng Shan Ho. Go ahead, Manly. Oh. Thank you, Mordecai. Um, actually, what I want to leave with is that, um, you know, you've done this righteous program for a very long time. And you said to me once um, that, you know, in all this darkness, you need some light. So along those terms, I just want to recite, it's a midrash. So it's not, it's not Chinese. And here is the poem. Uh, the sun also rises, the sun also sets. Before the sun of a righteous sets, God causes the sun of another righteous to rise. So that's what it's all about, hope. Beautiful. Now let me turn the floor back to my co-host from PBS, Mr. Ed Hirsch. Ed, would you like to say something to our audience? Sure, I wanna make sure I'm unmuted. There I am. Uh, I just wanted to add from WNET our thanks uh, to Violet Dufung for her, for her amazing film that we had to share here to our speakers for bringing alive uh, their memories and insights and looking at the chat box, what it inspired in those of you who were watching who had memories of your own and what a beautiful thing. And of course, to the Susan Mendes Foundation and Olivia for creating this event. A reminder that the film will be broadcast nationally this Tuesday, September 8th at 10 p.m. Eastern on PBS. 
and you'll be able to stream it afterward online. And I put in the chat box the link to the page on pbs.org that is will will house the film starting on uh, after it airs on Tuesday. Uh, you don't. You, we hope you watch it Tuesday night, but you can watch it and share it with others and share it with family and friends afterwards. And many of you I know are supporters of of WNET and uh, PBS that you identified when you responded, and we are always grateful for that. And and uh, it, it's terrific. So uh, we look forward to uh, many great things in this film. We look forward to working with the foundation uh, uh, on upcoming projects. We think this is the beginning of a great uh, partnership. So uh, thank you all for attending. That's fabulous. And I also wanted to uh, give my thanks to PBS and my co-host, Mr. Ed Hirsch, to all of our speakers, of course, and to all of you. This was a record setting attendance for us. And so that's very exciting. And have a nice rest of your day, everybody. And we hope to see you next week. Bye bye, everybody.